So hello everybody. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to join this conference. I, I really, really am sorry that I couldn't be here. I was really uh, looking forward to this, but it wasn't to be. Uh, my name is Kasha. I am the CEO of uh, TechClick. And what I want to do now, and perhaps in the next uh, 25 to 30 minutes, is really to give you a very broad overview of a range of actually commercial and industrialized applications of printed electronics. Uh, what motivated us to do this uh, was that uh, we see a lot of people still around who think that printed electronics is either very narrow or that it has no applications which are commercial today. And really, we, we, we're going to go through many applications today. I cannot cover every possible application which is commercialized today. I've selected a few. These are just the ones that I've selected. But anyway, my purpose is to show you that this is an industry which is very, very diverse. And it is also an industry which is uh, very much uh, already uh, commercialized and industrialized. So uh, I guess the first, just a quick outline of the presentation. Um, so first I'm going to talk about uh, metallization of photovoltaics and you will see why I, I bring that up. Uh, then I'm going to talk about um, perovskites and organics and, and other kinds of uh, photovoltaics. Then we're going to look at the display industry, so looking at uh, OLEDs and, and QD OLEDs and micro LEDs. Uh, then we're going to look at the PCB industry. Uh, we're going to look at passive components like MLCCs. We're going to look at biosensors, automotive, human machine interfaces, and many, many more applications. Of course, time is very limited, so I really have to rush through a lot of these uh, a lot of these applications uh, but just to let you know a little bit about us so i mean we at TechPlick, we are the home of the additive uh, electronics additive manufacturing of electronics the home of printed electronics we organize a series of on-site and online events um, on these topics and on topics which are very close online we have something about 1600 members from around the world and we organize events. And the next event that we organize is actually in the end of March. And that is focused <coughs> exclusively on all aspects of digital and 3D printing, from inkjet to electrohydrodynamic to aerosol, from electronic packaging to displays to PCB industry. But our flagship on-site event this year will take place in Berlin. Uh, I, I want you to already save the date. And if you know that you're coming, to book your tickets, because we now have very early bird tickets. So we'll be in Berlin. This is an event of about 70 exhibitors. Uh, the exhibition floor is already almost sold out eight months in advance. And there is a lot of demand uh, for this event. I'm delighted. I'm delighted to say. So let's go to the actual uh, presentation. So um, I guess the first one is that the photovoltaic industry is a booming industry. I've been looking at this industry for a number of years. And Last year alone, some 240 gigawatts of solar panels were produced. Um, you guys will know this very well because this is still predominantly a Chinese or, or mainly Asian, but mainly Chinese industry. And very reasonable projections suggest that the industry could reach something close to 800 gigawatts per year by 2050. Um, on the right hand, on the left hand side of your screens, uh, you can see the projections. Um, of the growth of this industry. And you can see that this is, it's gone through a tremendous boom, this industry. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act in the US, many of you may have heard of it, but it is a big subsidy program unveiled by the Biden administrations. And this will simulate production of solar cells in the North American market. And also we expect, or many expect that the European Union will have to follow suit and that too will stimulate production of solar cells in Europe. Uh, what is interesting, why is this relevant to our market, to the uh, printed electronics market? It, it is because the bus bars and the fingers are all uh, pretty much uh, screen printed. And here you can see the amount of silver which is used depending on the type of the uh, of the solar technology. So if you're look, look, looking at the older or the well-established technology today, you can see the amount is something around, let's say, uh, 12 or so milligrams per watt, and that is for the front and back metallization. 
and this will continue to to reduce and and the reduction of this is really an art in the industry because one has to print ever ever narrower and yet ever more conductive lines with a very good uniformity with no height variation with good adhesion and so this really is an art maintaining this this roadmap uh, but as we shall see later um, you can see that the newer generations of photovoltaics maybe the topcon n type or the uh, the h uh, the heater junction uh, cells uh, they need actually more uh, uh, paste per cell or per uh, watt produced and also uh, they may require different types of inks <clears throat> this is an industry which is served by screen printing and the reason i have it here is that this really is a fantastic case of into industrialization of screen printing so today uh, you can see this chart this is taken from the industry roadmap uh, from the 2022 data and you can see that in 2022, the backend processing for cell production, for photovoltaic, silicon photovoltaic cell production, uh, is around um, seven to seven and a half thousand wafers per hour. And one of these processes is, of course, the screen printing of the bus bars and, and the fingers. And when we talk about wafers, we are talking about relatively large wafers here. So these are wafers which are 182 by 182 uh, millimeters squared. Uh, and this is projected again to grow, and that shows you the the kind of the advancement in this in this technology, uh, both on the on the paste side and the material side, and really on, also on the machine making side. And it is expected that one could reach uh, 10, 12, um, <coughs> sort of uh, thousand wafers per hour. Uh, so the print speed here is very high. So the print speed is something about 400 to 450 millimeters per second. And this is really sustained by many innovations in the machine, in the paste, in the uh, even in the screens. Um, so the screens are going, you know, from photoimmutable emulsions to maybe laser patterned uh, PI based uh, screens. And really, this is an example of an industry where the line widths are becoming ever narrower. So here on the right hand side, you can see examples of publications. Uh, reporting uh, either with flatbed uh, screen, uh, actually mainly with flatbed screen, uh, you can see the examples of the line widths which have been produced. So in 2028, uh, one was at about 100 or so uh, micrometer line width, and now uh, the, the, the examples that are being reported are about 20 or so. And that is the state of the art. And as you know, uh, screen printing 20 micrometer line widths is with a good aspect ratio, uh, with good uniformity, it is really fantastic. Um, advancement of the art <clears throat> and the figure on the left hand side again this is taken directly from the industry roadmap and it shows you so if you look at the orange dots it shows you the the progress of line width uh, for the fingers for the screen printed fingers and you can see that already in industrial production one is below uh, 30 microns and this is again expected to reach something like 20 micrometers and the, the image on the top right is an example. This is from 2019 from Fraunhofer. I have it here because it looks like a very beautiful screen printed line with only a 19 micrometer line width and about uh, an 18 micrometer uh, height. So very almost a one to one aspect ratio. <clears throat> so, you know, this is the kind of the state of the industry today. Very well industrialized. Of course, screen printing these line widths uh, is a little easier than in electronics because if one has a defect, it, it's not the end of the world. You know, your efficiency comes down by a little, but your circuit or your, or your pixel is not dead. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier that new technologies are coming slowly but surely. And one of them is these heat junction cells where you have uh, layers of amorphous silicon uh, sandwiching um, uh, your, your silicon wafer. Because you have a hydrogenated amorphous silicon layer in there, it sets a very low uh, processing, uh, maximum processing temperature. So the maximum processing temperature becomes something about 250 degrees Celsius. And what that means is that a new generation of inks have to be developed for this application. So in this table, you can see examples uh, of the types of the inks. So for PERC, which is the standard kind of uh, solar cell today on the market, one has firing type pastes, and these are very conductive, you know, very high loadings, one achieves maybe two, three micro ohms per centimeter, per, per centimeter. Uh, very quick firing, very quick drying, maybe less than two minutes. Printing speeds are very high. You have like 400, 450 millimeter per 
uh, per second <clears throat> and the aspect ratio you can print is very good solderability is very good and so on and so forth when you go to these heat junctions your temperature is limited and the types of epoxy based inks which people use today need, need a lot of improvement so the conductivity is not as good you know resistivity is about six micro ohms per six micro ohms uh, uh, centimeter you know you need to dry them and cure them for long times uh, because of the nature of the paste, uh, your printing speed becomes a lot lower and that impacts your productivity. You can't print the same aspect ratios. You have to, you end up printing uh, wider lines, you know, instead of 30 micrometer line widths, you end up printing 50, 55 micrometer line widths. They're not as solderable. So a lot of innovation here is needed and it is definitely worth it because if you can, if you look at the chart on the left hand side, you see that uh, these heat junction cells are an up and coming uh, market so the light orange is plant capacity and, and the kind of the uh, darker orange is existing capacity so you can see it's already a, you know a substantial substantial um, a sized market compared to many other printed electronics markets um, so we looked we talked about silicon photovoltaics uh, and now I just wanted to you know look at a, a few other kinds of photovoltaics uh, that, that may involve printing of course the hot topic in the in the PV in the solar industry is perovskites because it keeps breaking many records and it has shown a very fast learning curve. So here, this data is taken from uh, the famous NREL chart. Uh, here, if you look at the, the, the kind of the red dots, uh, these are either perovskites uh, or with the you know, perovskite tandem, so perovskite on a silicon solar cells. And you can see that the efficiency is rising. So already the record, I think the record is from, uh, uh, from a center in Berlin, and I will tell you about that, it is over 30%. Um, so people are taking this very seriously and people are also trying to print it. So here's an ambitious project, still relatively early stages of the project in Rochester at the old Korak facilities. Uh, this is by uh, EMC, Energy Materials Corporation, and they have some very ambitious uh, goals. So of course they have a set of machines, you know, from a small blade coder to a roll to roll coder to a one station pilot printing, which itself is very large as you can see in the screen and then a very, very large printing machine, which they want to they want to adapt the process to this eight station machine, which has 1.5 meter web and can run up to 300 meters per minute. Um, and these are like either flex or gravel printing stations, in my view, I mean, I don't know this information exactly, but I think these are either flex or gravel uh, printing stations. So, so they want to dedicate this solely to fully roll to roll printing of perovskites on flexible glass, roll to roll with rapid annealing. They think they can reach uh, four gigawatt per year capacity. Uh, and this is a big business. So they may need you know, 20 million square meters of glass, something like 100,000 liters of perovskite ink per year and so on. And you know, this is not an easy uh, job. So I mean, already they're demonstrating it roll to roll, at least some of the layers, but these are very narrow web still, as you can see in these videos. My guess is that the transparent conductive layers, um, so the TCLs in this case, in this chart that you can see on the right, I think they are a metal mesh with a P-dot. So they're kind of a mesh composite, uh, flexo printed for the metals. And then I think the active layers, so the perovskite layer and the charge transport layer, the CTL layer, uh, I think they are based on gravel printing. Uh, so this is very ambitious, but for those of you who've been around uh, for long enough, you may recall the story of Konarka. Uh, which was a company in the US that raised maybe over a hundred million dollars. Uh, they were very interested in organic uh, PV and they acquired at a very low cost an, an X Polaroid uh, printing machine. Uh, but the problem was they could never adapt the OPV uh, process easily to an existing machine. And it's very challenging to go from a small size printer to such a, a large scale printer. But it demonstrates to you the, the, um, the ambition that many of these people have. Um, so we talked about silicon, we talked about perovskites, and now I just want to briefly mention the sort of organics as well, because people have been developing printed OPVs for quite some time. In Europe, there are many. So EpiShine in Europe, in Sweden, is doing a fantastic job. Armour in France has been building this up for a number of years. Uh, but I just want to highlight this company out of Brazil, uh, Sonyu. And they are really scaling up production of OPVs and they've been doing so for a number of years. So here you can see an example of their kind of production line. Uh, you can see the printing line. Uh, they do slot die coating 
of I think they do maybe I don't know how many lines actually they do many parallel lines uh, but, but what is you know they do it on a 500 uh, millimeter width web and they can achieve 98% uniformity across the web I think they have the option to print the electrodes using rotary flexo and then the uh, adhesives are slot decoded with, with lamination, uh, UV cured lamination. So the width here can be about 500 uh, or so uh, millimeters they can do on PET substrates and they can run this uh, web for long sort of lengths. I think in total they've printed something about 18 kilometers and they achieve an efficiency of around 6 to 8 percent. But given that new, you know, new materials, new OPV materials are coming to the market now, it is not unreasonable to think that at production level, the efficiency will, will reach uh, 10% or so. And uh, when we talk to these companies, they tell us that it is a time when their efficiencies are, uh, when their productions are really growing. So they expect to produce in the next two years, five times what they produced in their total history. So I mentioned that the record for perovskite PVs is held by a, uh, a research center in Germany. And the reason I bring this up is because if you come to Berlin, if you come to our show in, in October, uh, the day before the show on 16th of October, uh, we have uh, we have tours. We have master classes in the morning and in the evenings we have tours. And one of those, those tours will take you to one of the largest science parks in, in all of Europe, uh, Adlershof. And there you will be able to go and see uh, Helz, uh, Helmholtz uh, Zentrum in, in Berlin, who holds the record for perovskite PV. And you will also be able to go and see PVCOM, uh, which is a kind of a higher TRL level for PV production. And they've been involved in every kind of PV process from amorphous silicone now to kind of pilot scale production of perovskite PVs. So come and check it out and come to this event because this, I can promise you, it will be a fantastic event <clears throat> and then just a quick note that also some people are inkjet printing pvs here are two examples one is from poland zaule and the other one is from france dracula and for example zaule on, on the left hand side these guys are inkjet printing sheet to sheet the perovskite layer in air uh, so this is a very thin layer and then they screen print the back contact with just silver paste so this is a much thicker layer of about maybe 10 10 micrometers or so and the expected capacity for them in late 2024, if everything goes to plan, is something about 7,000 square meters per year. And they've achieved very good efficiencies of about 15 to 16%, but under very low light conditions. So under 500 lux or so. And these pictures show you kind of some images of their products and some images of their, of their production process. So, uh, so far I really uh, talked about uh, I really just talked about mainly the, uh, uh, the the photovoltaic industry, looking at silicon PV, looking at perovskite PV, looking at organic PV, and now we what we want to do is switch to the uh, to the uh, display industry. Um, already, inkjet printing is successful in OLED industry in the production of the thin film encapsulations, but what is interesting is that it is also becoming now an essential process in the production of QD OLED displays. So what are QD OLED displays? So if you look on the left hand side, you can see the structure. Basically the idea in, in, in a nutshell is that you have a blue OLED and then you color convert using uh, green and using red quantum dots. And this technology is kind of pursued by many, including Samsung and also TCL and, and, and others. And as you can see on the right hand chart, so the chart is from Omdia and then the statement is from UBI Research. You can see that the production of these uh, QD OLED displays is expected to rise. For example, Samsung alone expects to increase its capacity from 30,000 month substrates per month to about 45,000. Um, so let me just uh, switch the slide one second here. Yeah, so just to give you a sense of the scale here. So this machine, this example here is from Cativa, who went through a tough patch, but I think they've, they've got the order from Samsung. At least this is what you read in the news. I don't have first-hand first -hand information. But this is a, a Gen 8.5 um, machine, inkjet printing machine. So it is it can handle mother substrates of about 2.2 by 2.5 square meters. And this is being used for 4K or even some people say 8K display. So if you think about a 4K 
uh, display, you have something about 20, you have to print something about 24, 25 million uh, different colored pixels per display and in per mother glass you might have maybe three to six of these displays so you have to print uh, maybe you know many many millions of pixels and this is very challenging because in order to avoid variation in displays and micro effects you really have to keep the um, um, the variation of the ink deposited ink you know you're depositing between one to six picoliters per, per droplet you have to keep the variation to less than very very much less than 10 percent and you have to do all of this you know a minute or less than a minute per, per glass and so these are big machines with very 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 good control algorithms um, very good control electronic systems maybe they have 50 print heads and each print head has something about a thousand nozzles so these are really kind of industrial industrial machines. Uh, I just want to say that the, the kind of the industry is also going beyond inkjet. And, and one of those areas where uh, going beyond inkjet may be necessary is the uh, micro LED uh, application. Uh, you know, to, to create three color micro LED, you can either transfer the three colors uh, or you can have the blue LEDs transferred, which is a very hard step. And then add color converters, so quantum dot color converters uh, on the top. Here I show you two examples. In both cases, electrohydrodynamic printing is used. And electrohydrodynamic printing, not going to the details, but it can go to resolutions that are not possible with inkjet, and it can also handle handle higher viscosity inks. So th the example on the left is is very new. Is I think from a couple of months ago, showcased at one of our events at TechPlick. Uh, is by Scrona, a Swiss company, and you can see that they printed eight micrometer pitch uh, quantum dots with no bangs. And on the kind of the, the, the second image on the right, you can see that this is uh, a you know they print a five micrometer pitch with a bang. Uh, this is incredible. And the, the, the pictures on the right hand side are from Fraunhofer AIP in Potsdam near Berlin. Uh, actually, they'll be coming to our show as well and showcasing this. And here you can see that the quantum dots are. Um, you know, allow you to reach maybe a, a thousand DPI uh, micro LEDs with, with color conversion. So this is, I think, an area where the technology match between printing and, and the needs of the market are very good. So it's one to want to keep an eye out. And if you're interested in knowing more about this, again, you know, come to Berlin because Scrona is going to be giving a masterclass on electrohydrodynamic printing, and Fraunhofer AIP is going to be there exhibiting. So check out our events. You know, as I said, uh, come to Berlin. Uh, and if you want to learn more about digital printing, actually, we have an online event you can attend from where you are. Fantastic event uh, covering all aspects of digital printing, including electrohydrodynamic printing. And if you want to know about micro LEDs, again, we, as part of our library, we, we just had an event on it. And you can see the speakers, they're really fantastic event. So you can get all of the content there. So, so far we looked at um, photovoltaics and quickly displays. And I, I want to show you a number of other applications of printed electronics, again, which are actually industrialized today. And one of them is this passive component, which is absolutely everywhere. And that is the MLCC, uh, the multi-layer ceramic capacitor. Um, and you know, you can see a picture here on the on the bottom right showing you, you know, what they are, if they're everywhere. And it's a market that is actually growing. So in these charts here, you can build there from Murata Manufacturing, one of the main producers of MLCCs, you can see that the market for them is rising. And this is driven by several mega trends. Uh, so on the one hand, we're going from sort of combustion engines to uh, ICEs, you know, internal combustion engines to electrification, electrified cars. We are going from non-automated to ADAS to autonomous driving. We're going from 4G to 5G and you know, very high frequency 5G. And all of these things translate into higher demand for uh, for MLCCs. So it's it's a growing market and it is actually mainly printed. So you have multiple, you know, hundreds of hundreds of printed layers. And uh, you can see an example of a printing facility here from Kemet. And on the right hand side, there's images from Tayo Yuden. Um, they show you, if you look, if you can look carefully, they show you how advanced this industry actually is uh, because they have managed to thin each layer with dried thicknesses below or around one micrometer now. So the electrodes, which are typically nickel, uh, nickel paste, screen printed or gravel printed, they are, you know, one micron. And then the dielectric is similar. 
and you know, fantastic innovation on material side and fantastic process uh, innovation. I think screen printing is the dominant process here, especially in the uh, um, in the mobile business. So about 80, 85 percent of the mobile, uh, you know, MLCCs, MLCCs for the mobile industry are screen printed and, and the remaining are gravel printed. Uh, in the automotive market, maybe the picture is a little bit more balanced. So gravel has a bit of a more market share. But I mean, these are just my guesses. I, I don't have very detailed uh, market information on this. Um, so yeah, very advanced, very advanced industry and all printed. And then another kind of a printed market is the uh, is in the PCB market. So here you can see two examples. Actually, most of the solders are screen printed, uh, sorry, stencil printed. And if they're not stencil printed, they are probably jetted. Um, and the reason I have this here is because a lot of people say that printed electronics can never go to the PCB industry. But, but I tell them it is already in the PCB industry. The problem is once it becomes successful, you know, once printed electronics becomes successful, then nobody calls it printed electronics anymore and that and that is one of the challenges so here you can see examples of stencil printing you know stencil printing obviously lower than that screen maybe running it at 100 to 150 uh, millimeters per second typically type 4 solder is used these days with 20 to 30 micron particle sizes and i guess that people with stencil printing probably print about 160 170 micrometer line widths at a pitch of about a 0 0.4, 0 0.5 millimeters. I think very few, probably nobody does a pitch of about 0 0.3 uh, millimeters. Uh, also, another really interesting market in the PCB industry is, and it is one that is growing now, is that the solder masks and the legends are actually inkjet printed. And that has many, many benefits. It's already industrialized. It's a, these are automated machines that can handle relatively large substrates, maybe substrates of about 610 by 610 millimeters squared. Um, you know, you might have up to nine or maybe more kind of uh, print heads in there. And it's an additive process. So you don't, you know, you, you save on materials, you save on process, you save on factory, uh, real estate, and the materials, you know, for these available from Agfa or Tayo and others, They've, they've really improved. So now, you know, materials with no bleeding, with very good resolutions, uh, maybe three mil, you know, pretty standard, uh, uh, you know, line widths and so on can be printed. And so I think this is an industry that is established and in my view is, is gonna keep uh, is gonna keep growing. So we have to rush through many applications. Um, you know, printed electronics is in the automotive industry. It has been for some time and it is growing. So, you know, if you have occupancy sensors, you know, is somebody sitting on the, on the on the chair? Those sensors are mainly screen printed, and here all these pictures are from IEE Sensing SA from Luxembourg. You know, probably the main supplier in this industry. Um, if you have heaters, a lot of seat heaters are screen printed. Not all of them, but a lot of them are screen printed with uh, PTC carbonings. Uh, people are trying to add sensors to the driving wheel just to make sure you know uh, are, you, are you hands on, and a lot of these are again screen printed. And people are trying to add screen printed sensors to battery management systems, not yet commercial, but something something to watch. So already printed electronics is in the automotive industry. And here are some more advanced applications. <clears throat> this I really like because this is a, a touch screen that is in a non-flat shape or in a slightly shaped format. This technology was developed by PolyIC, which later was acquired by Quartz in, in Germany. Uh, they have a very good in-house process for roll-to-roll -roll production of touch foils uh, using uh, metal mesh. <clears throat> so these are very narrow metal meshes, maybe a, a 10 micro line widths, uh, with 100 micrometer spacing using uh, uh, silver nanoparticles, you know, giving maybe 100, 100, 100, 100, 100 nanometer thickness. Uh, so very advanced printing process, but the, the whole innovation is, is not just a film. They, they take the film and using industrial machines, they can kind of functionally bond the film onto a 3D surface and they have special adhesives which allows them to move this film while it is being bonded onto the right position on the back of a 3D plastic object uh, before it cures. So very, very special adhesives and very you know commercialized machines. Uh, and, you know, this is already, again, in the automotive industry, and these are the examples that I have, you know, from Volkswagen to Geely uh, to BMW, uh, which, are, which are using this. 
And oh, I don't have time to show more slides, but even classic in-mode electronics, in case you guys are familiar with in-mode electronics, even that is seems to be gaining traction. You know, a lot of automotive companies have tried it and they are giving it, uh, close to giving it their seal of approval. So printed electronics is again already uh, kind of a big business in the uh, medical industry. So, you know, um, glucose test strips were, were printed, uh, but also all, all kinds of other sort of medical biosensors or sensors like ECG electrodes, uh, skin patches are printed. And here I have two examples here. I think uh, the example in the middle is from Mecoprint, a company in, uh, in Denmark. And what they do is they print medical EKG sensors using an automated roll-to-roll -roll screen printer, and they produce maybe 100 million units of this per year. Um, so it shows you that the you know, screen printing of, of, of kind of biosensors is, 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 is an existing market. And this is, a, this is a market that is actually advancing. So more complex devices are being uh, now printed. Um, so here I want to show you an example from Applied Materials. Sorry, uh, I was distracted for a second. So, um, so here you can see more complex devices being printed. This example is from Applied Materials. Here you can see that they're printing about four layers uh, with, with very well-controlled thicknesses and also a very complex shape. So the reason I have this here is that people are going to multi-layer, precision, well-aligned screen printing, even with viscous silver nanoparticle paste. Uh, and they have to control the thicknesses very well. And they have to achieve really, really low cost. So maybe a 0.2 dollars per sensor. And also very high speed printing, you know, 150 to 200 millimeters per second. Of course, not as high speed as, as the case of the, uh, um, the solar industry, but nonetheless, a very, very high speed uh, printing. Uh, so people are demonstrating these complex things and they're beginning to translate them into manufacturing. And I have this slide here because, again, from applied materials, because manufacturing these things is, is by no means easy. So just to manufacture a four-layer, you know, multi-layer, four-layer biosensor, uh, you can see the machinery needed. So you first have to screen print uh, the, uh, the first electrodes uh, with very well-controlled thickness, maybe with, uh, let me check, maybe with... Uh, uh, five micron thickness on a line width of 50 over 50 micrometers. Then you have to dry it. Then you have to do the carbon paste printing and then dry it. Uh, then you have to print uh, sort of multiple rounds of printing, maybe get up to 20 or 25 micrometer thickness of the dielectric and then UV cure. And then you have to print the uh, AG chloride, you know, silver chloridings uh, and thermally cure. So all very kind of complex. Sorry, I'm probably now confusing you and I'm probably boring you now, but I just want to go through some applications as fast as I can and I'll, I'll wrap it up now as soon as possible. So I just want to say that, you know, print electronics is diverse. It's everywhere. And it is also in electronic packaging. And I don't just mean like dispensing sort of sintered paste or kind of um, solder. People are now developing technologies and have been doing so for maybe the last five, six, seven years, developing technologies to add uh, EMI shielding but site selective EMI shielding onto packages. So here are two examples. One on the left is from Herias in Germany, not too far from me, I'm in Frankfurt, they're in Hanau, and also aerosol. And the aerosol example is from uh, Entrium in, in Korea. And what they do, so one of them uses aerosol, the other one uses an inkjet process, but they can add different kinds of inks on the package itself and metallize just site selectively part of the package which requires EMI shielding. And then they can jet or, or fill kind of compartments or walls so that if you have a complex maybe system in a package with many different kind of ICs, you can create EMI shielding walls around it. Of course, there's always an incumbent and then, you know, PVD deposition is, is, is there, it is working. But I think these processes are, you know, have something going for them. They are a lot simpler. The machines are smaller. Um, you don't need a, a big uh, PVD machine. You don't need a vacuum system and so on. So membrane switches, and membrane switches, of course, they've been around forever. Maybe the bread and butter of still most screen printing houses around the world. So they print membrane switches for all kinds of industrial appliances, for home appliances, uh, and so on. But this industry is also adapting and evolving. 
so on, on, on the one hand, they are trying to now in, increasingly add uh, molding machines and, and kind of to, to go towards in-mold electronics. Uh, on the other hand, they are trying to add more electronics uh, into the HMIs. So I have here on the middle and on the right uh, two examples. Uh, one of them is, oh, actually both of them are from Kundish in, in North Germany. And these examples are HMIs with multiple layers of printing. They're on a PCB, they're on a kind of a copper substrate, but they have multiple layers printed on the top. But what is really interesting is that they are also integrating electronics in there. So these are examples of, but by electronics, I mean ICs. They're integrating ICs in there. So these are examples of flexible hybrid electronics. Uh, electronic in packaging, you know, printed electronics in packaging, Again, people are making progress, and one example is from Jones Packaging on the right-hand side. I think these are flexible printed, uh, very simple cabinets onto a package, onto a pharmaceutical package. And the idea is that when somebody takes one of their pills, uh, the circuit is broken, and so you can measure that the pill was was taken. And then they create the whole ecosystem of connecting this with a with it with an app on your phone. Um, and I, one trend that I personally really like, and I'm really fascinated by it, and actually it is one of the big themes of our, of our upcoming online conference next month, it is printing in 2.5D and 3D. So printing complex PCBs in 2.5D and also totally printing 3Ds or metallizing a 3D object. And uh, you can see many prototypes on the right-hand side. But on the left-hand side, I've got two examples which I thought were interesting. So one of them is a multi-station printing. This was adapted uh, by a few generations ago of phones by Lighton, and the antenna was totally aerosol printed onto the mobile phones, a, a very large market. Of course, this went out of fashion uh, because of the design changes and because of the adoption of metallic frames. Uh, so that, that design kind of lost the market. But again, there is a lot of debate these days about antennas in the mobile business, especially because if you have a 5G or a millimeter wave 5G phone, you would probably need multiple antennas in your phone and you want you might want to make them transparent. So the combination of printing and the transparent inks is a very useful proposition for this. And then the other image, uh, I don't know if you can see, but the, but the glasses, uh, these are kind of industrial protective glasses that do automatic defogging and so on. And all of these electrodes on the side are actually kind of 3D printed onto, onto, the, onto the 3D object itself. So many interesting applications also for kind of 2 to 3D uh, printed electronics. But if you want to know more, you know, join, join us, join our conference. So, yeah, I mean, there are so many applications. We couldn't possibly, possibly cover all of them. Um, you know, it's endless. And what we always say is that printed electronics is in everything from a baby diaper to a precision missile. So it's a broad market and really I hope that I've shown you that there are very much already today and, and there have been for many, many years industrial applications in passive components, in displays, in the solar industry, in the PCB industry, in HMIs and home appliances and you name it. So, so the, you know, one challenge we have is that when printed electronics or when we succeed, people don't call it printed electronics. So yeah, let's call all of these, I think, printed printed electronics. And please mark your calendars. You know, on 17th and 18th of October, really the whole industry will come to Berlin and we want you guys to also join us. It will be a fantastic event. We expect more than 600 very high quality attendees and about 70 exhibitors. And the exhibition floor is already sold out. And it's a very global exhibition floor, as you can see. Really fantastic. So. And also, if you want to join, if you if you have something very innovative to present, you know, contact me, and my contact details are at the bottom <coughs> of that page. So, once again, thank you so much for uh, inviting me. Sorry I couldn't be there. My apologies. But I hope you enjoyed the presentation. And if you have any any questions, just just you know, email me and enjoy your conference. So, thank you so much, and uh, see you soon, and definitely see you in Berlin.